that story. It's great to, to hear testimonies of what God's doing in our lives. Uh, so, uh, like Lisa said, my name is Mike Sandusky. I'm the lead pastor here at Living Hope Church, and um, uh, yeah, I'm just so excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, I know it is, it is a little bit unpleasant driving around in the snow, uh, but as we gather here, I believe God wants to bless us. God wants to encounter us that as we meet, it's not an accident, but rather we, uh, we believe that uh, we have a living God and that he draws near to us, that God is present with us here. And, uh, and I believe God wants to stir us up and bless us this morning as a people. Um, we're going to be kicking off a new sermon series today, um, and, uh, and I'm not quite sure what, what, what the title of our series is, is ultimately going to be, and, and I'm not quite sure how long we're going to go uh, in it, but uh, I really, uh, the, the emphasis of the, the series here is talking about what does it mean to be a called, empowered, and glorious church. Um, When you look at the Bible uh, and you see uh, the church that Jesus built, you see the way Jesus and his disciples operated and moved and and, and power and and really through a society that didn't really want them, uh, and yet God still moved powerfully. And then you look in the book of Acts and and the church at a time when it had very little uh, political power, in fact, no real political power, no real uh, financial resource, no real social power. In fact, it cost people to join the Christian church. You would have thought that it wouldn't have been able to work. It it wasn't logical. It wasn't something human minds would have come up with. And yet, through faithfulness, the power of the Holy Spirit, the preaching of the gospel, uh, the church exploded to becoming the most influential group in human history. Uh, And and so uh, I want to really ask ourselves, uh, why is it um, that the New Testament church often kind of operated uh, in in a way that just seems to have a power that we're, we're, it's not that we're lacking it entirely, but it it does seem like maybe there's a place where we could drink from some foundational truths the Bible to to see God move in our church in a more glorious way. And I've been thinking about this a lot as a pastor. Uh, So in Ephesians 4, the Bible tells us that God gives gifted leaders to the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And, And what that ultimately means is that one of my primary jobs is to help equip you and stir you uh, to go out and do the things that Jesus did, to do the things that the New Testament church did, to talk about Jesus, to make disciples, uh, to go to unreached people, to go to unloved people, uh, and to serve one another with a full, a full heart. And, uh, and so I'm really, I, you know, I, wanna, I want us to, to crack into this and talk about this because I believe that God wants to bless us in a way in 2024 that we just see our church mobilized, right? If I had to describe uh, what I really feel our, my heart is, what I feel like the Holy Spirit's stirring in me, it, it's that we would be a church that, that floods this city, that, that my heart is very much to myself go uh, to places in this city uh, where people are unreached with the gospel, uh, or are unreached by the church, uh, or who are uh, you know alone and isolated in the culture, and I want to mobilize Christians in the church to come with me. Uh, and, and so there's going to be a lot of invitation uh, over the next year, and even today there's going to be invitation. Uh, at the end of this sermon, I'm going to invite you to to say yes if you're here and you're you're like, man, I really I really want to live a more active Christian faith. I really want to live a, a life that does look more like the life in the New Testament, uh, but I haven't known how. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to today, I'm going to really open the door to the invitation. I'm going to teach you, you know, what the Bible says about what this looks like and, and how we do this. So uh, that's really the heart of this message. And you're going to hear a lot of this, this theme of, uh, of being a glorious, called, and empowered church um, over the next year, uh, but especially through this series. So with that said, I'm going to read from Ephesians 3. I'm going to be looking at a lot of verses today in the Bible. Um, and... Uh, And we're going to start here in Ephesians 3. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn there. It will show up on the screen behind me. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to just kind of look at what's said here uh, and uh, and ask ourselves some questions about what does this mean for us? So uh, would you read with me? It says, For this reason, I, Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. All right, so real quick, if you're, 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 you don't know who, what's going on here. Uh, Ephesians is a letter to the church. Uh, it was a letter by a leader who was also called an apostle named Paul. 
right? He's saying, for this reason, I, Paul. Uh, He was constantly being arrested uh, and getting in trouble for how aggressively uh, he went about preaching the gospel. Uh, He was rejected. He was beaten up. uh, he He got resisted a lot. He got arrested a lot. And yet, it didn't seem to discourage him. He just kept going. Uh, and that faithfulness through that difficulty uh, seemed to produce a, a sort of power and fruitfulness in his ministry that is almost unmatched uh, in history. Um, and it says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. He's saying he's suffering on behalf of of the work he's doing for uh, Gentiles, which were all the non-Jewish people, which the Ephesians would have been in that category. He says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. So he's talking about him getting saved. So before, if you didn't know this about Paul, he hated Christians, right? So God created this, this, this life in Paul uh, and put, the, put this call in Paul's life where he was basically one of the most effective Christian uh, leaders in the early church. But God, when he was looking around trying to find out where this guy should come from, he picked a guy who hated the Christian church, wanted to extinguish it, and was actively arresting and seeing Christians put to death through the work he was doing. And God radically saved him. And he says, if you've heard of my story, which they had all heard of Paul's story, by the way, right? Because they were afraid of Paul. In the book of Acts, it says when he got saved, the church was like nervous to let him around because they're like, we know who you are. You're the great enemy of the church, right? This would be like the, 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 one of the great Muslim leaders of our day converting to Christianity and then becoming like one of the most effective Christian evangelists uh, on the planet. That would be what this is like uh, for Paul uh, and his salvation. Uh, and so he says, uh, assuming you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace, right? This is a work of God's grace. It wasn't, it was a gift from God. It wasn't because Paul was good. In fact, Paul was, uh, was, was evil and sinning and doing the worst kinds of evil to the church. And yet God's grace redeemed him. His grace was given to Paul for, uh, the church. He says how this mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. He says, when you read this, you can perceive my insights into the mystery of Christ. He's saying it's going to be evident by the things I say how well I know Jesus. He's going to say, you know, and I would say this, this is true, that if you know Jesus and you see people, uh, it's, my wife and I were in a couple of, of, of settings with some uh, people we don't know, uh, several non-Christians, and, uh, and it's interesting because occasionally Christians will pop up, and it's amazing how quick it is to identify, oh, this person knows Jesus, uh, when you're in a group of non-believers, and, and then you're talking, and, and some of those people would even say, well, no, I'm a Christian but there's a difference between claiming that you're a Christian and knowing Jesus. I just want you to know that real quick. Uh, And Paul here is saying that as you read what he writes, you're going to be able to perceive his insight into the mystery of Christ. You're going to know that he knows Jesus. And he says, this mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations as it has now been revealed in his holy apo- or to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This should catch your attention. He's saying some event has happened. There's been a revelation from God to us, to the people, about God's great plan from before time began. It's, it's a mystery now revealed, now being revealed. It wasn't made known in the past, right? The Old Testament uh, is, is sort of a, a, uh, it's a buildup. It's a foreshadowing of what's going to come to Christ. And Christ is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament. He's the fulfillment of God's work to us, God's will for us, God's love to us. It comes through Jesus. He's saying this has now been revealed. He says this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He's saying this mystery, this great mystery, is that God is redeeming all people through Jesus. And he's taking people who are far off. He's taking people who are racially divided. He's taking people who are culturally divided. And he's making one new people through the blood of Christ. He's saying you're included in this. This is the great plan of redemption for humanity. Guys, it doesn't take long to look around and say, man, humanity really needs redemption, right? We need saving. We need help. And if anything, we are not unified, right? We're not known for our great political unity, right? Uh, or religious unity. And God is saying it is through, uh, through Christ, God has a plan to unite people who are very divided, right? Not because they're good, but by the goodness and mercy of God, by the blood of Christ. And he says, uh, he says uh, that we are all fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And he says, of this gospel, I was made a minister. All right, that's, that's going to be a key word. 
uh, in this sermon. Minister. Paul was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. He says of this message of Jesus, gospel means good news, uh, of this message of Jesus' salvation for all people, that through faith in Christ we can be saved that we are all fallen away from God, we're all broken and sinful, and the natural human intuition is that we have to earn our way back, that we have to work our way back, that we have to make ourselves righteous. And the whole Old Testament laid out, laid out the rules and the laws. If you do these things, you will be righteous. And the whole Old Testament, they tried and they tried and they failed and they failed. So God, in an act of mercy, gives them a sacrifice system because they were unholy and they need to be purified. And the consequence for crime, the consequence for sin, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's life, right? It's, 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 we punish people. There's a payment that needs to be, to need to be made when, when, when we, we sin, we do wrong. There's a cost, right, that needs to be paid. And so God gave the sacrifice system as an act of mercy that instead of the people giving up their lives, instead of the people paying the price, he would accept animals in their place. That's the whole idea of the sacrifice system. It might seem brutal to some people when we think about a sacrifice system, but it's a wonderful picture of God's, God's glorious grace. It is that life is taken from someone else that you would be forgiven. Right? But it foreshadows something greater. It foreshadows this gospel that Paul's talking about, that, 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 that we get the sacrificial system and, and things that are less than us, less, value, less valuable than us, get counted as equal get counted as valuable in us. So, you know, a sheep getting its life taken would, would cleanse the sin of people, right? The sheep that's less well regarded. And God's mystery, God's crazy plan that still baffles people all over the world. I've been, I've been trying to do some ministry to some Muslims. This completely baffles them, right? Because it's not, it's incomprehensible uh, to humanity. Uh, and that is that God himself entered into human history to become the perfect once for all sacrifice. And, and, and Paul's saying this, this, this gospel has now been revealed that, that if you didn't know this, God came into the world as Jesus Christ and he lived the life that we should have lived. He lived a life of perfect righteousness. He obeyed all the laws in the Old Testament. He was perfectly innocent and he was perfectly righteous. And he wasn't just perfectly innocent and perfectly righteous. He did all the good. He served and he, and he blessed and he healed and he fed and he loved and he poured out his life for others. He did all the righteous good. Good. He was the perfect human. He was God in the flesh of infinite value and infinite worth, perfectly glorious, the light of the world, the hope of humanity. And when he entered into human history, we saw this glorious, wonderful, perfect God, and we killed him. If you did not know, part of this is to reveal that the Old Testament was right. We are wicked beyond our wildest dreams. One of the gospel messages is this, is that, is that you are far worse than you think you are. I am far, like, I'm not saying you, I'm saying we when I say this, but I am far worse than I think I am. Again, look around the world. It does not take long. As you see a culture move into a post-Christian state, what we're seeing around us is people, they are ungrounding themselves from God, they're ungrounding themselves from others, and guess who becomes God when you've ungrounded yourself from a God outside of yourself, and when you've ungrounded yourself from systems and community around yourself, you yourself become God. It should not surprise you that we live in a society that tells us what you feel on the inside, that is objective truth, and you are basically a little God, so you can now push that out into the world, and now the world has to bow down to your will. Right? That's what God does. Right? If God is real, he has all the authority, he has all the power, we have to bow to his will. It doesn't really matter what you think, in the end, he wins, because he's God. In our world, we have a world that's, uh, that's pulling away from God, pulling away from other people, and saying, you yourself, you get to decide. What you feel is now reality. What you feel is, 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 is truth, right? And everybody has their own truth. But, uh, it, I mean, first graders can realize the, flaw, the philosophical, like, logical flaws in that kind of thinking. Like, everyone's truth cannot be the truth. It cannot be objective truth. It cannot be, you know, a, a truth that can be applied, you you know, willy-nilly. And th that whole system falls apart when you evaluate it deeply. But here's what people do. We, we, we criticize Christianity and we ignore the own flaws in our own thinking. That's, that's what we often do. And Paul is saying that God has come and revealed a gospel that redeems our brokenness, that cleanses our sins, that makes us new people, and that draws us together into this new family. And here he's saying he's a minister. He's a minister of this gospel. How did this happen? It says, he was made a minister. Who does that? God did it. God made him a minister. How did it happen? According to the gift of God's grace. It was by God's gift, God's grace. 
which was given me. Oh, wow, okay, it was given to him. How? By the working of God's power. Why do I point that out? Verse seven is so critical because it tells us how does God equip? How does God move? How does God stir? You in here right now, you might be like, I can't be like Paul. Right? I, can't, I can't do, you're talking about a radical church. I've read the Bible. If you've read the Bible, you're like, I'm not like that church in the New Testament. Well, here Paul's revealing it. He's saying he was made a minister by the gift of God's grace It was given him by the working of God's power. And then he goes on in verse eight, if it wasn't clear, he says, to me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. All right, he says, to me, listen to this, catch this, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, You're sitting in this room and you're thinking, I might be the very least of all the saints. Paul's like, no, I got that title. Paul willingly took this title. How and why? So, you know, we live in a culture where if you're going to get up in front of a crowd and you're going to speak or you're going to write a letter that has authority, you're not going to get up and say, well, I'm not qualified. That's what Paul's doing here. Right? You, we've got to understand how different the gospel of the kingdom is, how different the culture of the kingdom of God is. You ever read Jesus and you're like, man, what is this guy saying? You get slapped and you turn the other cheek? I can self-defend. That's holy. Right? You got Christians writing like whole treatises on how we can self-defend and why we should be able to shoot people when they come into our, and it's just like, Jesus is like, turn the other cheek. Right? It, it, his truth is incomprehensible to us. It does not make sense to us. Right? And I don't think that Jesus is saying you can never defend yourself. What I think Jesus is ultimately saying is his standard of love is so much greater than you. Uh, you can comprehend that it's almost incomprehensible to you. To love your enemies. Do you even have enemies? I mean, if you do, don't you just avoid them? Don't you block them on Facebook? You're definitely not showing up to their house on Thanksgiving. <laughs> You're not inviting them to your house on Thanksgiving. Right? The culture of the kingdom is so radical. And here, here Paul, he, he's, saying, he's basically saying, like, in America, you get up and you say, here's why you should listen to me. Here's all my credentials. Here's everything I've done. And here's what Paul says. He says, I was the least of the saints. Of all the Christians, I'm, I'm the lowest. How can he say this? Why would we listen to him, right? As Americans, we immediately want to sh- shut that off, right? I, I've noticed that as a, as a pastor, is that, is that as I, when I speak and I, I, I talk about vulnerability or I, I confess weakness or I confess uh, you know, shame for how I've led or how I've failed in the past, I will sometimes have people who come to me and they're like, man, you know what, like, um, you know, that, like, I don't think you should be saying that, right? You're going to lose people if you say that. And again, I'll tell you this, I, I realize that, I actually think the Bible says this, that if you act like Jesus, you talk like Jesus, you teach the Bible the way it's written, that people will leave your church. A lot of times we think that about the most controversial issues in our culture, but Jesus often talked about love, which is not a controversial issue in our culture. And, and his view of love, I believe, is so radical that it rubs people the wrong way, who even might consider themselves Christians, right? So here Paul is, and he's, he's, he's essentially saying, I'm the least of the apostles. And, and how does he say that? Or the least, not the least of the apostles, the least of the saints. How does he say this? It's because he knows the power is not his. He knows the call is not his. It, it, it's, it's from God to him. And here he says it. He said it in verse 7. He said, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of the power. To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. He's qualifying. He's helping you see, right? If you're in here and you're like, listen, you want to know the qualification? Here's the qualifications for being called. You believe in Jesus. You give your life to Jesus and you walk with him, right? Just walking with him is a call into his kingdom. And I believe he wants you to begin to, to talk to people about who he is. I believe he wants you to begin digging into the Bible and digging into it with other people. Right, when I first became a Christian back in 2006, what happened to me was I read the New Testament and I was like, no one's ever told me this. I'd never heard any of this. And so I started going to my friends in, in high school, or uh, not, I was in college. I went to my friends in college. I met some high school uh, kids and I just started saying to them, like, do you know what the Bible says? And, and when, when you say it, like, they're like, what do you mean? Like, I mean, first of all, they're all like, no, we really don't. Uh, but then when you begin to tell them, they're like, it does not say that. And you're like, yeah, it does. And they're like, really? And, the, and through that, like, God led several people to faith in him. And I'm telling you this, like, you can, you can do the same thing. This happened very early. Before I was, I wasn't formally trained. All I was doing was encountering Jesus, and I was in awe of him. All right? Like, are you in awe of Jesus? If you're not in awe of Jesus, that's a good place to get. 
That's a great place to get. In fact, everything I'm going to talk about, I really think, needs to come from a place of being in awe of Jesus, fully convinced he is who he says he is, fully convinced that though we can feel like the least among all the Christians, he wants to call us and empower us, and he's loved us, he's poured out on us. I believe this is so critical to who we're called to be. He goes on here, he says, he has been given this grace to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Right? If you're not in awe of Christ, I want you to know he has unsearchable riches, unsearchable goodness. Like This is the kind of language the Bible uses. Right? As I'm talking about the Gospels, I'm talking about Jesus, he has unsearchable riches available to us. Nothing in this world is like this. We use and consume things, and they fade and they perish in this world. But Jesus is unsearchable riches. And he, he's, he's here to preach, to, uh, to, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And what's the point of this? He says in verse 10, he says, that, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. I mean, that is, there's some density there, right? There's some density in Ephesians 3, what Paul's trying to get at here. There's so many mind-boggling things here, the unsearchable riches of Christ, that God wants to use the church to reveal his manifold, he wants to reveal his great wisdom, his great, like God created all things, like quantum mechanics and physics and, and the universe, and the way he wants to demonstrate his greatest wisdom is through the church, through the work he's doing in the church, right? It, it, again, like the radical idea of our salvation, the fact that we were so far, like again, the gospel message is you were so far off, you don't even realize it. Like we're far worse than we could ever believe, but God's glory, God's grace, God's love is far greater than we could have ever hoped. Right? That's the reality of the gospel. That's the reality of what Jesus has called us into. God is saying, this is the pinnacle work, the pinnacle glory of my work in creation. This is the one that shows people, shows not just the earth, but shows the heavenly. He, he's here, no, here, he's saying that, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Right? That's like, right? We have rulers and authorities here on the earth, but they're all like mortals and humans, and, and, and they pass away and they die. He's talking about like spiritual authorities. I mean, this is kind of a mind boggling concept. He's saying he's going to reveal his glory and his wisdom to all, all of heaven and of earth. Right? He's saying the church is, is this pinnacle thing. And in verse 11, he says, This was according to his eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. That God had purposed this from eternity start to redeem that his wonderful grace, his wonderful mercy could be demonstrated. That he could take a rebellious, sinful, evil people and make them holy. And not just holy, but knit them together. And not just knit to them get together, but to look at them and call them sons and daughters. And to unify divided people. And to make them into a body that proclaims his glorious goodness and his light. And talks about the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. This is, what, this is what God is doing. This is the ministry that Paul was called to. This is the ministry that you are called to participate in. Right? You were made, I, here's the thing, I know this. I know you feel this, I know you understand this. You were made for a purpose so much greater than what we're often living in. I remember when I, 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 before I was a pastor, I was a scientist and, and I helped make vaccines. And, and I remember sitting there and I was like, what am I actually doing? Like, what's my purpose? Like, what am I doing in this job? And it's like, you're making vaccines to basically keep like the beef and pork like industry, like making enough beef and pork for the, like, that's it. Which some people might be like, it's a really important job. You know, we got to have bacon. Like, thank you for your service. You know, some people might say that, but like, like what? Like, that's not, that's so not satisfying. In fact, the more I thought about it, the more depressed it got. I'm like, this is what I'm doing with my life? Like, this is it? Now, fortunately, I was a Christian. I was a believer. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to talk to as many people at my workplace as I can. You know, I'm going to ask them, hey, what do you think about God? Hey, what do you think about church? What do you think about these things? And, and I'm not going to be a bully. I'm just going to ask and I'm going to listen. And when you ask and you listen and you make invitations, you don't look like a bully. But what you end up doing is sowing a lot of gospel seeds, right? Like, I, I think the worst kind of evangelism comes out of fear. It comes out of obligation, where you think, I have to do this, and if I don't get it right, this person's going to hell. Whereas I think 
As we evangelize in the name of Christ, here's how we do it. We do it with confidence that God blesses faithfulness. That it isn't dependent on how gifted I am at presenting things, but rather it's dependent on how in awe of Christ I am as I make glorious invitations to him to people. And I recognize some people are going to say no. People rejected Jesus while he walked it on the earth. Walk, walked it? Walked on the earth, right? Rich young ruler rejected Jesus. The Pharisees, many of them, not all of them, but many of them rejected Jesus, right? And, and you see the same idea here with Paul. Like this should, I hope this is blowing your mind, and if not, I'm gonna try to get you to a point where it does in this sermon because it's, it's the gospel truth. Like here's the thing that should blow your mind is that Paul was not like gifted and qualified to go. He was sent by God, and God blessed him because he was faithful not because he was gifted, right? The same, here's the thing, God wants to bless you, not because you're super gifted at evangelism, but you're faithful, and when God says go, you go. If you wanna see the power of God at work in your life, when he says go, you go. And you don't go in fear, and you don't go in self-confidence, and you don't go thinking, I've been so trained, I cannot fail. You go saying, Lord, I'm with you in the wilderness, you've told me to go. In fact, I think the more unequipped you feel, often the better it will go, because you have to depend on God. Paul talks in 2 Corinthians about when we're weak, he is strong. Talks about his thorn in his side, and Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient to you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. All right, I want you to think about that. You feel very weak. You feel very weak. It's why you don't evangelize, right? That's it. It's why we don't evangelize. It's why we don't talk to people of other faiths. It's why we, we kind of live this timid life as a Christian, It's so, that timid life of the Christian is so different than the life Jesus was living in the Gospels. It's so different than the life that was lived in Acts. And and here's what's crazy, you're timid because you feel weak, and here Jesus is saying, my power is perfected in weakness. What should be blowing your mind is that you're right there, guys. You're so close to seeing the glorious power of God in your life, not because you're really great, but because you go in faith. Faith is persevering and and, and obeying Christ even when you feel uncertain. It's obeying Christ even when it's hard. And I actually think, here's what I think, like the idea of faith is not a completely new mystery to you. It's not, like you understand, you show up to church when you don't want to, you read your Bible when you're like, I don't know how this is going to bless me. Lisa shared a story, she's like, you know, I I, I went into the women's conference without faith, and she went because God told her to go, and she felt stirred, and she went, and God spoke to her, and God stirred her, and God brought her to life, and now she's sharing that testimony. Right? So we do understand faith. Where I think we're weak is that this, this, this thing has happened with ministry in the church. This is really where I'm getting at here. This thing has happened with ministry in the church where, you know, here we read Paul and his call, and here I am up here preaching, and, and it's like somewhere along the lines, the call to do ministry, it's like it was for the church. And certainly pastors and leaders are important in the church. The New Testament makes this clear, right? And certainly we aren't called to go alone. We're called to go together. But what, what has almost happened is that like the idea of doing ministry in the church, it has slowly kind of fun, you know, funneled up to where the, lead, the pastor, the staff, and maybe a few gifted Christians do all the ministry, Right? And, and the rest of us, we're not, we, we don't, do, and, and you can't do ministry unless you're really trained. You know, you can't preach uh, unless you've gone to Bible college. And, 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 you know, why do we do that? Well, we do that because you go to Bible college so you don't get your theology wrong. But I don't know the last time you checked, a lot of colleges that started as Bible colleges have gotten their theology real wrong. In fact, I think they're the worst sources of bad theology in our culture today. They're the ones publishing the books, telling you why you don't need to trust this is God's word and how, how Jesus didn't really mean what he said when he said it. And, and Jesus, in the meantime, is not like, hey, go get an education and then go. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'll tell you what, as a pastor in the church, I can tell you about the fear of screwing this up. I can tell you about the fear uh, of sending people who don't feel that equipped or that trained. You feel like a madman. Like I talk to other pastors and I feel like I'm insane because I'm like, well, you know, I just led this guy to faith and now I'm teaching him how to lead other people to the faith. And they're like, well, hold up a minute. What if his theology is not right? And I'm like, man, Jesus said, go make disciples. He didn't say, uh, now obviously he says, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. But that's sandwiched in between the really important parts. What are the important parts here? All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to Jesus. We go in that context. We go in that purpose. And I'm not saying training is not worthwhile. I'm not saying we don't teach people good theology. What I'm saying is, clearly, right, I think this is an American weakness. 
We plan to not fail. We don't like failure. We don't like discomfort. Walking in faith is very difficult for us. Right? I'm not saying we purposefully go like stupid, like we don't walk, like I don't, it doesn't matter, I know anything. Like I'm not saying that. I'm saying faithfulness in Jesus is so much more powerful than you realize. It's the thing that gave Paul his power. Very educated. Certainly, his knowledge of the Old Testament came in handy. Certainly, the things got, but like, that's how faith works, is that you go, and what happens is God equips you on, on the fly, and sometimes you fail, and you think, oh man, I gotta, I gotta like learn this. But you don't quit going. You don't quit going. You, you walk in faithful. That faithfulness is the most important aspect to going in God's call. That's what I believe. That's what I believe sets the New Testament church apart from us. I don't think it's that complicated. I think Jesus said go and you go. I think when Jesus tells you to go, you go. I think when, 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 when God says you to, tells you to say something, you say it. I think this, again, the only really strong foundation you need, you need to know Jesus, you need to know the gospel, and, and I would say like a good measure is that you're in awe of him. But if you really want to go, you want to become in awe in, of Christ, right, go in faithfulness in his name. I, I, I just have to tell you, like, this isn't just, I didn't just get some wild hair, like, I am, this is actually coming out of a place of, of repentance and conviction because I am so ashamed. As I read the Bible and I, I just, here's the thing, like, I was taught to do church a certain way. I was taught to lead the church a certain way. And, and I think there's so much wonder and so much goodness about how we gather together on Sundays. But the main goal of church is not just to, like, equip a bunch of people over and over and over again with the same stories. And, and guess, I know you're sitting back and you're like, I go to church. Is this really what it's all about? It's like we're meant to be a people on a mission, a people on the move, a people going right? Suddenly this, if you begin to reach out to your community, you encounter some Muslims, you encounter some non-Christians, you encounter some people who are, who are trans and really struggling with identity, you encounter some people who, who, who just hate Jesus, hate Christians, right? Suddenly this meeting is going to become way more important to you because this is where you get equipped to go do that. But if you're not going and doing that, you're not going to see the necessity for this. And this just becomes sort of this weird buffet where Christians get really fat, hear a hundred sermons, but never tell anyone anything they've heard, right? That's not the call, but that is how, unfortunately, this is, why, this is where the shame comes through. I have led too much that way. I have led too much that way. And, if, and, and so I just, I believe God wants us to transition. And I don't think this is like, again, this is some radical shift. This is us saying as a church, this is, this is, where, this is, your, this is your invitation. You're invited to this, right? You're not not a Christian if you don't do this. Jesus makes you a Christian. What I'm saying is I think Jesus has a life and a purpose and a thrill and power he wants to show you that will completely change you and transform you and draw you into mature Christian faith and will also lead you into seeing people give their lives to Jesus and will move us forward. And this is already happening in our church. It's actually always been happening in our church because even when we don't do it right, God's always faithful. I just want you to know, there's a lot of people who are really critical of the church. I'm not trying to be really critical of the church here. I'm trying to be critical of my own leadership, uh, which I, 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 I hope, uh, you know, it, it, that's, that's, that's my heart, is that, is that I want to lead the way I feel like Jesus is calling us to go. And this is happening. There are people doing this. And this is the model that we were, that we were given <clears throat> in the Bible, is to go in faithfulness, right? I read Matthew 28. Let me read another one. Acts 1, 6 through 9. It says, so when they had come together, this is a similar time frame. Jesus has died. He's resurrected. He's visiting the disciples. They all get together. They ask the glorified, resurrected Jesus. They say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So he's saying, hey, is this it? Is this the final event? Is everything going to be brought to a head here? Is this happening? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. He's like, don't worry about that right now. It's not for you to know. It's not for you to worry about. And he says, but, <laughs> he shifts their attention somewhere else. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and behold, a cloud took him out of their sight. It was Jesus' parting words, right? It, it, it ties with this Matthew 28, uh, this idea that we receive power. God wants to empower the church. And what does he empower us to do? To bear witness, to talk about him, to share our awe of Christ, to share the glorious, wonderful gospel, to share the beautiful truths of the, the Bible. But I'm telling you what, this will grow cold and stale if you're not going in obedience, right? What I, what I have found is... is um, 
And I, I just want you to know too, like there's, there's a part of me as I'm communicating this, I'm praying for the Holy Spirit, right? I'm preaching this sermon in faith because I'm at the edge of my mind comprehension uh, about what does it mean to go in faith. I'm trying to articulate things that feel like the unsearchable riches of Christ. Like I'm trying to put words to things that God has stirred. And I'm gonna tell some stories because I think stories communicate really well. That's why Jesus told a lot of stories. I was convicted recently because I'm like, I need to use like a parable of Jesus every sermon. So I got one in here today. But like, because Jesus told parables because we remember stories, right? And I'm up here, I got a science background. So what does that mean? That means as a leader, I've tried to equip people with lots of knowledge, but I've neglected the lab, right? I'm like a really bad college professor. That's probably been my pastoral MO, right? And people have left the church because of that. Now, I would hope that they would show me some grace and mercy uh, because I've always also been a person of, of great personal, like, like I, I love to do personal ministry. So I've been like, it's weird because this has been who I've been. I have, I, from the front, I can get really technical and really deep, and I like to talk about philosophy, and I like to talk about, I like that. And I like to feel really equipped when I go, and I like to feel like I have all the answers. So something that would keep me from evangelizing is I would never talk to a Muslim until I knew everything I could know about the Quran and all the counter arguments, and so I would avoid that. And, right, you know that feeling, right? You're like, I don't wanna talk to somebody who, who doesn't know Jesus, because I don't know all the arguments, right? Uh, and so uh, that has kind of been how I've led. It's like, let me equip people and fill them up. And if I fill them up enough, eventually they'll start to go. And I just feel like God said, bro, like, where do you read that? Like, yes, you need to teach them all that I've commanded you. But teaching people like philosophical positions is not what Jesus commanded us. Am I right? Like, thank God that's not what he taught us to, you know. It's not that there's no value in that. But again, like, when you understand, when you know Jesus, when you know the glorious gospel, right, there is a place for meaningful theology. We certainly, we do not, like, that's not going to be our weakness here. We're not going to be like, well, it just doesn't matter what you believe. No, 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 we're going to teach solid theology. Where we have lacked is in sending people and commissioning people and calling people. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Jesus and the demon-possessed man, uh, but, it, you know, I know I talk about it a lot, but I think there's a principle here, and it's a story worth remembering. He, he walks up to this guy. Uh, they get across the sea. There was a storm that tried to stop him from getting over there. They get to this other side of the sea. Uh, it, it, it's confusing. Who are these people? Because there's a pig farmer nearby. Jews would not have been pig farmers. So they're, they're, they're really bad Jews, or this is a Gentile region, right? One of those two things is true. Here's the reality. They don't want God there. Right? If that's not obvious enough, here comes a demon-possessed man out of a cave who was known for being chained up to the cave, and here he is running at Jesus naked. I don't know about you, but if you go to lunch today at Cheddar's, and a guy with some broken chains is running at you naked, you're probably not going to be like, this seems like an evangelism opportunity. <laughs> I'm probably not going to think that. Uh, Jesus stands, and you know what's crazy about it, you read the story, the guy runs up to him and falls at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because all authority in heaven and on earth is in his hands, right? And, and, and he falls down at Christ's feet, and Jesus says, what's your name? And he says, Legion, for we are many. So this man is demon-possessed, he's incredibly strong, he's naked, he's terrible. Like, this is like worst case, most difficult evangelism opportunity, right? The guy's got a legion, what does Jesus do? He casts the legion out, the demon's asked to get thrown into the pigs, uh, and, you know, even if it was two or three demons in this guy, or however many, like, you know, the pigs run off the cliff, and you can, th you can see it's like Satan's spiritual warfare here, because here comes this Jewish rabbi into the region, this pig farmer, all of his pigs get killed, you know, you can just see the headlines in the newspaper the next day, uh, pig haters destroy local economy right? Like, and then what happens? The people come and they see, they're actually, they're so scared that the demon-possessed man is in his right mind. They ask Jesus to leave. And the demon-possessed man walks up to Jesus and he looks at him and he says, let me come with you. And Jesus says, no, I want you to go and tell everyone how merciful God has been to you. So first of all, like, this is a story from the Bible, and this is more radical than any invitation I have given you yet. I want you to know that. Like, I am terrified to be like, okay, guys, go out into the city, like, and tell people about Jesus. Like, I'm terrified that somebody's gonna be like, well, what, don't you guys believe in the Trinity? And somebody in here is gonna be like, well, I don't know if that's what we believe, right? Like, I shouldn't be afraid. Like, like here's the reality. It's like, I, I believe God is faithful. God, like, the church is not mine, it's his, right? And I do believe we have taught faithfully about the Trinity. We've taught faithfully about theology. We've taught faithfully about these things. What we haven't done is we haven't gone faithfully as a church. Amen? Right? Like, okay, and I don't, I don't want to bully us. We have gone some. I just think God wants us to go more. I think God wants to stretch our faith, and I think God wants to blow your mind. Like, I got some story. God has been blowing my mind this last year, right? I have more stories of gospel power, right, 
than I, in the last year, than I have, I don't even have time to tell you all the stories of the things God is doing, and my mind is blown, and, and I just, and I can't even, it's hard for me to comprehend, because these are the unsearchable riches of Christ, as we walk with him, like, he just, he does the work, like, guys, he does the work, like, I, Thanksgiving, I'll tell you a quick story here, then we'll come back to the demon-possessed man, it'll, it'll all tie together, uh, we're walking by faith here, right, everybody, uh, I spent Thanksgiving, like, we ended up having three Thanksgivings, and, and, and our third Thanksgiving, I, recently we went to, like there's this whole story. It's a crazy story. I'll tell the whole story. I'll tell the whole story. It's fine. It's a snow day, right? Nah, everything else in your day has been canceled. No, here's the thing. So, uh, like, a year, a year and a half ago, I had a family member who died, and this family member was, like, in a rough place, dealing drugs in a shady part of life, just doing dark stuff. Was, was not likely a believer, a Christian. I would say that they were not. And I did the funeral because it's my family member. And every funeral I do, I preach the gospel faithfully. Do you know how many times I've told the gospel and just felt, this is futile, this is falling on deaf ears. You know what, I, I've been discouraged by more sermons and more things than I haven't been discouraged. And, and I'll tell people and I think, yeah, does that even work? You know, but I keep doing it, right? That's faithfulness. It's not my sight, it's, it's trusting in him. It's not, I don't walk by faith, I walk by, or I don't walk by sight, I walk by faith. And, and, and so I do it, well, <clears throat> six, you know, maybe a year later, um, it turns out that there, there was a, a, a kid, a teenage kid in that, in that, and he heard a seed went into his heart. And a year later, he gets arrested, he gets, he gets put in a juvenile detention center, and, and he reaches out to Pastor Mike, his, his relative and, and a pastor, and he is just, he is wrecked, he's wrecked by, um, he's wrecked by his conscience. He's like, does God love me? Does God forgive me? Here, I'm arrested. Like he, in his head, getting arrested means like he's lost the love of God. And so I share the gospel with him. I open the Bible up to him and I read 1 Corinthians and you know, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no heart of man imagined what Jesus Christ has prepared for those who love him. And, and he's like, the Bible says that? And we spent 30 minutes talking about those four or five verses right there. And he was just in awe of Jesus by the end. And we met for a few more weeks. And, and this, is a, this kid's Gen Z, so like people are like, this is a hopeless generation. But here's what I know, God calls every generation and he's calling this one. And I actually believe he's going to do a work in this generation unlike what we have seen in the last few. Uh, I believe that. I'm, I'm a huge advocate for Gen Z. I love them to death. Uh, I think God gave me a Gen Z soul and a millennial body. Uh, that's my excuse for why they beat me at dodgeball, but uh, <clears throat> I love them. And, and, so, and he's just in awe of the word of God because every generation is in awe of the glorious, unsearchable riches of Christ when you see it, when it's preached, when it's revealed, right? Uh, and, and so we share it, and, and he gives his life to Jesus, and through him I get connected to another guy who's created a, committed a way more serious crime who's still in jail. And I tell him about the Bible, and then he gives his life to Jesus, and he and I are still meeting. And while I'm talking to him, it turns out he's got some friends in the Hispanic community, and, and he's been telling them about me and telling them about this church, and he's inviting them to our church. And so I start thinking, man, we don't speak Spanish, and man, I've really neglected, like, I've, Lord, like, you know, I just think, God, what if I, what's wrong with me? Like, there's a whole community of people I have just not reached. And in fact, many of them are, would classify probably as unreached people. And I don't think any church, into any English-speaking church is even trying. And I'm like, all I have to do is learn a language and I could reach a whole group of people who feel neglected, who feel on the outside. And, and so I just begin to pray. And, and, and then my wife is praying and she's like, a, she's got, my wife's got the, the, she's got the prayer life of a 90-year-old Baptist widow, uh, which is a real intense prayer life. Uh, it's, it's like, that's, that might be one of my, the greatest ways God equips me in my life is that my, I just say, Hey Mackenzie, would you pray about this? And, and so a couple of weeks pass and we end up, we end up going to the Hispanic Heritage Festival. And while we're at the Hispanic Heritage Festival, there's this little booth there and, and there's this gal there, Maria, and, and, and we meet Maria and she started this group and it's called Latinos Connect. And the whole idea is to connect Hispanic speaking immigrants with, with English speaking Americans so that they can become friends. And I'm like, this is perfect for me. And, and I tell her I'm a pastor and I'm like, I don't know if this is a culture divide or if she just doesn't like pastors. And at the time, I'm like, well, she just must have been flustered. Turns out she doesn't like pastors. Uh, I, I mean, I say that in jest. We're friends. But like, you know, just this last Thursday at Thanksgiving, I'm hanging out with Maria. And I, asked, I finally asked her about her spiritual life. And, and she's essentially telling me, like, I, you know, that, she, that religion can be hard for her. And she's had some bad experiences with the church. And, and, and so <clears throat> anyway, 
rewind, rewind the clock here. So we meet her, and, and, uh, and, and then we go to this event, and I, by the way, every single time we do this, I am terrified. I want you to know, I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm like, I don't speak English, and I'm here, or I don't speak Spanish. Sometimes I don't speak English. Uh, I, I'm at the Hispanic Heritage Festival. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not just white. I'm tall and white, so I really stick out. And, and like, and we're going, and then like, and I just, I don't, you know, and then you realize, like, you find out, man, I've got my own, like, like, bi- like when you're in environments that are unfamiliar, it's almost like you just, you just, I don't know, you're, you're, all, you're not comfortable, you're out of your comfort zone, and, and, and so anyway, so then, you know, that leads us to this dinner, we go to the dinner, and uh, at the dinner, I'm terrified, because I'm like, are we even supposed to be here, because we, like, we get there, and then, and then it goes phenomenal, and we get connected to all these people, and I meet this guy named Ehab, who's Lebanese, and, and you're, I'm, at, I'm at Latinos Connect, and I meet a Lebanese Muslim, and I'm like, what is happening, and it's like, God is like, hey, this, listen, you, you need to reach both of these communities, so I'm like, okay, uh, and, and here's the thing, like, I couldn't have arranged this on my own. Like, God just opened doors and we just walked through them. And they were uncomfortable doors, right? When I set something up for myself, I try to set up like a nice softball. I'm like, I'm gonna plan it all very well. I'm gonna do, go in my strengths. And God's calling me to go in my weaknesses. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. His power is made perfect in weakness. And it's not about walking around figuring out where are you weak. I think it's ultimately about saying, I feel weak and I'm gonna go anyway. I'm gonna go trusting you, Jesus. And what will happen is it will electrify your spiritual life. It will electrify your Bible reading, right? Especially when you begin to talk to Muslims who, who think that this is like completely corrupted and it's a little bit offensive and you're sitting there talking to them and you're like, I, I, I'm gonna, I, like, I need to drink from this well and be so full of life so I can talk to these guys and not debate them, but reveal the unsearchable riches of Christ more and more as I talk to them. And so so anyway, long story short, like preaching the gospel faithfully at a funeral has led to like, I spent this last Thanksgiving, my wife, I, you know, invited some friends to come and, and I, you know, it was kind of a messy thing because I was like, I didn't want to invite too many people to this event because he was inviting us to his house. It was a whole, there's like a cultural barrier and a language barrier and a communication barrier and we're texting and it's a whole thing. But anyway, it was really, it was really amazing and, and God's just opened these doors you know, and now we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we invite them to our house? And, you know, I don't know how much you know about Islam, but they eat halal. Like, it's like kosher. Like, Jewish, Jewish people eat kosher, while Muslims eat what's considered halal. And so, like, I'm, like, reading online, and I'm like, this is way too complicated. It's like reading the Old Testament, trying to follow it a little bit. Uh, and so it's like, you can't cook in a pot, like, you can't cook food in a pot that's ever, like, touched pork and, and serve it to a Muslim. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, every dish in our house is, t-. and then I'm like, we gave the guy cake. And, you know, anyway, but it's like, there's certainly grace and mercy uh, you know, from, from Jesus on, on that. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, the point being, guys, I'm out of my comfort zone, right? <laughs> my wife's out of her comfort zone. I'm like, hey, I think we might need to like cook them food that's halal if we invite them over. Anyway, um, but the point being this is that all, like there are all these opportunities and now all these relationships. And we were sitting there at Thanksgiving and and the guy across from me, Muhammad, he was one of Ehab's good friends, and they met at the, the Islamic Center in town, and, and he's Muslim, and, and he's from Libya, and, and, um, and anybody that's seen Back to the Future, you might be biased about Libyans, but this guy was really nice, and, uh, and anyway, he's sitting, he's talking, he speaks Arabic and English, and we're talking, and I'm asking him about his faith and the Quran, and, and, and then, like, we're in this room full, of, like, with some guys, some, some Hispanic people, so there's a couple of Mexican guys, or some people from Venezuela, and, you know, English is no one in the room's first language except ours. You know, my wife, myself, you know, Michael was there, his son, Ledger was there, and, uh, and just even bringing my, like, I'm like, okay, Jesus brought people when he went. I used to do things too much alone, so I'm going to try to bring people, and, 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 you know, Michael was faithfully talking about Jesus, you know, and having conversation, and I could just, you know, he's just trying to kind of keep the door open, and Mackenzie, you know, gets in these really deep one-on-one conversations with the women, and, and, and I'm, you know, and I'm sitting in here trying to have these, and it's just like, I thought, this feels like the New Testament, and here I am in the middle of, I'm in St. Joseph, Missouri, and God's like, Look at what's here. And by the way, I just want you to know, like, the, the, the amount of need here is so much higher than we could reach as a church, right? Like, and it's, it's some of the most joyous, like, ministry I've done. And, and sometimes I come away thinking, how fruitful really is this? But at the same time, I have to be like, man, God, you created a situation that did not exist three months ago, two months ago, what, six weeks ago, this didn't exist. And, and now God has, and I'm just like, Lord, you can do anything. So I ask, pray for Muhammad, pray for Ehab, pray for Maria, pray for, you know, Adon, pray for Hasiel, pray for Elisabel, like all of our friends. And I'm like, I want them to know Jesus. And I believe, I'm praying, Lord, like, bring one of these Muslim guys to faith in you, which is, a, which is a very controversial thing, obviously, especially difficult, um, and, and turn him into an evangelist. And by the way, that sounds impossible. 
I just want you to know. But like, I just, I want you guys praying. I just thought, Lord, I want our church to pray for this. I want, I want to pray for this and I need to go faithfully. And again, I don't know, but here's, here's the invitation. Here's what I'm getting at is that Jesus is inviting you to live a life where you go. You go to people, you go to places where you're not comfortable, where you're not confident, and he wants to bless you as you go. He wants to move and show you his power, right? Maybe you come to Latinos Connect with us. Maybe you, I mean, here's the thing. Like, what I'm describing here I would call pioneering work. It's when you just go into an area. And I would say, we need people in this church doing this kind of stuff, uh, you know. And, 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 you know, I would say, do it and don't do it alone. And, and do it in a community because you, you will get discouraged. You will sometimes feel like, man, am I really making a difference? And, and so this is where the church strengthens us, right? Um, and, oh, man, I wish I had more time. I'm running out of time here. But I'm, I'm going to make an invitation. Here's what I'm going to do. The band can come on up. I've been really struggling to get my, through my notes lately. But uh, here's, here's the thing. My parable was going to be the parable of the seed sower. All right? Somebody sowing seeds haphazardly all over the place. Some fall on the path. They get snatched up. That's going to happen to you if you go start sowing seeds. It's going to be discour- it's discouraging when you see seeds get snatched up. Some of the seeds you're going to sow... They're going to go into shallow soil. You're going to meet people, and they're going to be like, I love Jesus. Yes, I'm in. And then a month later, they're gone. Six months later, they're gone. You're going to meet people who the seeds go in, and and, and it seems like, oh, there's something growing there, something growing there, but then their job takes them away, their career takes them away, the concerns of this world, wealth takes them away and distracts them, and it's going to be discouraging. But then Jesus says, sometimes the seeds will fall on fertile ground, and one seed, one gospel message at a funeral goes into the ground, goes into a heart, and suddenly hundreds more seeds come from that. Hundreds of fruits come from that. And I'm just like, Lord, man, I just feel stirred. We were praying this year for 300 baptisms. And, and um, you know, we, we didn't quite see it. But I just as I was praying this week about it, I just I felt like Jesus said, hey, the seeds have been sown for more than that. And I thought, okay, I can take that. Like, and I believe that, I believe that, I mean, here's the thing, we, we baptized 50 people this year, praise the Lord, right? The year's not over yet, we can still baptize more people, right? Like, we're not that big of a church, and, and I just, here's the, I don't, I, next year, let's, let's, let's aim for 500, I don't know, maybe we'll hit 70, uh, but like, like I, at least sowing the seeds, you don't always see the fruit from the seeds that you sow, and I think this is, the Bible doesn't say be too worried about that, it just says sow, 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 sow those seeds, and, and so, what I'm saying is in this parable, you know, you, you can be discouraged when the seed gets snatched up. You can be discouraged when it goes in and somebody's excited for three months and then they're gone. You can be discouraged when somebody takes the seed, receives the seed, and then they get distracted and they leave the church or they, they get faded or they're, 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 their faith never really proves fruitful because they get so distracted. But when the seed falls on fertile soil because you're faithfully sowing everywhere, the Bible says it will produce a crop a hundredfold, a thousandfold what was sown. So in the end, it's not about... It's not about us getting it right, right? I, I think in America, we plan so that we like, we try to take the weeds out. We try to cultivate so all the ground is fertile. And God's like, don't worry too much about it. Just sow, just sow seeds. And when I plant a seed deep, it will produce a hundred, a thousand times more than you could ever produce on your own. Uh, and I just believe this is true. So I believe God wants to invite us into this. You guys, um, here's the thing. We've already received this call to go. If you're here and you're a Christian, I believe it's your call. And you may not feel equipped. You may not feel, but one of the quickest ways to find out where you're weak is to go. <laughs> and uh, and God, will, God will bless you and show you his power. So I'm going to invite you guys to stand up. Here's the thing. If you want to say yes to this call, if you, you want to come with us as we do this, you know, like I said, this isn't one sermon or a sermon series. This is really our heart for the next year at Living Hope. Um, and I want to invite you to come with us as we obey Jesus in going more faithfully. Um, I just want you to, let's just all close our eyes and just put your arm, your hands out uh, in front of you. Um, and I'm going to pray that God would bless us and stir us and that he would highlight places we can go and people we can reach out to, people we can invite into our home, neighbors, uh, events we can go to, people we can go to, all in the name of Jesus, right? We go, we give people ourselves, but we also go in the name of Jesus. I think that's the, those are the only two things that we do um, as we walk in faithfulness. So, Heavenly Father, I just, I pray for those who, who are here and they want to say yes to this, that they're saying yes today. Father, I pray right now that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit onto them. You've given us a call. We're not waiting for a call. God, you've given us a call. You said go. 
You have all authority in heaven and on earth. So I pray, Lord, that you would pour out on our church this morning uh, a desire to go, highlight places that we can go, that we would go in the name of Jesus, the love of Christ, and we'd give ourselves over uh, as we we are uncomfortable and we are weak, but we see your power perfected uh, in our weakness, in our weak faithfulness. Father, I pray you pour out faithfulness on our church. Lord, we will do, I I want us to be a church that sows far more seeds than we ever see uh, the fruit of. Lord, that we would bless uh, other churches and other places God, that that we would just faithfully sow seeds and not worry too much about who gets the fruit or where the fruit goes. And Father, I just pray, pour this out, highlight places, strengthen us. God, help help our leaders to to equip the saints for the work of ministry, but Lord, help equip and stir our our saints with faithfulness that they would go in your name to do the ministry you've called us to do. Jesus, you are the glorious one, our Savior, our great hope. We are in awe of you for all that you've done. This world and its purposes are dead and dying But Jesus, you are the Lord of glory, and you have a kingdom and a new life for us that's so much better, so much higher than anything we could ask or imagine, so much greater, so much wider than anything this world has to offer. And I pray you call us into it. You go with us. And Lord, show us your power. Show us your glory as we walk.